we want to not accept emotions instead of realizing that by accepting them, by naming them, we don't agree with them. We're just accepting them and accepted emotions actually diminish. Whereas when you deny emotions and say, stop crying or, you know, oh, you're okay, you're okay when a child falls down, that we're actually stopping the very mechanism that helps people be what you are talking about, self-regulating. Um, you know, I mean, emotional intelligence is the ability to identify, access, and control your own emotions and to recognize, understand, and consider the emotions of others. So if you don't know what emotions you're feeling, how do you access them? Welcome to The Body Never Lies. I'm your host, Leela Lutz. Each week, myself and experts from around the world help you uncover the secret ways your body communicates with you to empower you in your own individual health journey. Now, if you guys have been listening to the show for a while, you might have noticed that pretty much all of the guests, if not, yeah, pretty much all of them, have made a reference to parenting and how important the way we parent is to foster children who are independent and can take care of themselves, be authentic and be in touch with their own emotions so they can thrive and do this whole self-care journey and take care of their own health. So I couldn't do a Foundations of Health series without having my parenting guru on so we could actually put into practice what all the other guests are saying. How do we teach our kids to be authentic self-nurturing, self-loving, and emotionally aware. Well, Fern Van Zyl's passion is working with young children and fostering independent children, hence her business is called The Independent Child. Now, while she was bringing up four of her own children, she fostered children from disadvantaged backgrounds, I think seven in total, ran a home-based family daycare and facilitated programs for babies and toddlers at church before She even became a Montessori educator. Then as a Montessori educator for over a decade, she owned and operated a Montessori-based learning centre for babies and toddlers on Sydney's North Shore. Now she works internationally consulting families around the world and she also has mentored and coached and trained many other Montessori educators. Now, you don't have to be a fan of Montessori to love this podcast. Um, Fern is a Montessori educator, but her parenting tips are so practical that you can apply them to any family. And I think the key thing about Montessori is the, the motto of Montessori is help me to do it myself. And the premise behind Montessori is that we create an environment where children can do things for themselves and be intrinsically motivated. So I hope you enjoy the show. Good morning. Good morning, Fern. Welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on The Body Never Lies. I'm so excited to have you here because we have talked so much in all our other interviews about parenting, really, and childhood and the importance of parenting ourselves and the importance of the way that we parent our children going forward so that they can be vulnerable so that they can regulate their own emotions so they can make good choices for their health and so I had to have you on today say okay Fern how do we do this because most of us are going oh my god I didn't get that in my childhood so how do we do it because it can't just be a rejection of what our parents did and doing the opposite you know otherwise what I don't know what's going to happen but I really wanted to talk to you today about how do we raise children who are independent and can be in touch with their emotions and can say, oh, wow, this is not working in my life. So what I need to do is X, Y, and Z, rather than go for the latest exercise craze, distract with work, make more stress so I don't have to deal with any of this emotion. So I guess what I first thing I want to ask you, Fern, is what is, your business is called The Independent Child, what is an independent child? Okay, um, well, for me, independence... The reason we went with that is because being a Montessori educator for that long and being in the classroom, 
um, for with parents and with children, um, realizing that you know <laughs> there was a lot of dependence going on um, for both parent and child, really. And I loved the picture. I read a story about an eagle and how the eagle mother actually takes their baby up to a really, really high nest. And when it's time to learn to fly, they literally hit them over the edge and then follow, but there's nothing they can do other than fly below mm. to, to watch them struggle. And I think, you know, this is the sense of independence is when you, when you look at the meaning of it, it says self self-regulating, you know, um, self-controlled, out of the influence of the control of others um, and the support of others. So in order to learn that, you have to be given freedom to be yourself mm. instead of control to become something. And so it starts from really little that, you know, as parents we're we we start controlling, you know, what we don't like and what we do like and what, what we have an idea of what our children should be instead of observing them and giving them the freedom to to be themselves mm. um, separate from us. So I love the word autonomy and I usually give both when I think about independence as, you know, someone is self-regulating, self-governing, inner directed and how do you become that but by giving chance to explore and um the world at your own at your own pace you know i'm separate from others it means separate from others Mm. so you're taking personal responsibility for your life and not blaming others so independence for me is also coming to the place where you don't blame your parents Mm. for the way you turn up yeah, that's an important one, isn't it? Yes, because, um, you know, no parents are perfect and we are not doing a perfect job either. Um, so we have to take what we don't throw the baby with, out with the bathwater. It's about taking responsibility that in all, even in growing up, your choices affected who you became, not just what your parents did to you. Mm. You know, right from little. I know I was in my 30s when I stopped kind of, you know, if mum had been this and if mum had been that and if mum had been the other thing and um, apologies. Yeah, it's a, yeah right. <laughs> I mean, it's important. It's a very important journey, this yes. self-realisation and very much something that I work with, with in coaching people is that, you know, this concept of mother and father ideals, you know, they're archetypally ideal. They're not reality, you know. So a lot of us can spend a life looking for a mother or father that we never had because we want this movie kind of mother or father. But our parents are just normal people like us with problems and, you know, their own stories with their parents and their own negative beliefs and life issues and relationship issues and stress. They're just normal people doing the best that they can. So I think what's really important is for us as adults going wanting to do better is we need to actually look at our own childhood and go, well, you know what, I'm a grown-up now and I take responsibility for myself and the perception that I have on my childhood. And obviously there's varying degrees, right? There's abusive childhoods. There's just, you know, my mum worked and she was never there. There's varying degrees of loss and trauma and what you missed out on. But no matter what it is, the only way we can move forward is working through that with coaching or therapy or, you know, taking responsibility for that and then paying it forward, I guess, into the next generation. Definitely. And, um, you know, the fact that we're here means that we were nurtured. Yeah. (laughs) Um, To the degree, you know, most of us grow through through the difficult parts of our childhood more Mm. than we grew through anything that was easy easy if you think of it Mm. you know the fact that if you've moved a lot you learn emotional resilience through being able to adapt and change and and build new relationships and things that you know somebody who stayed in the same house for their whole 
20 years or 25 years before they left home um, has that fear of doing starting over and starting again and things so yeah, I think it just comes back to whatever you had you know embrace everything that was good and don't um, as as who you are as a unique human being um, and then you know be prepared to have a life of learning mm. and so that you can um, change when you need to so how do we start giving our children independence when does it start is it first the first independence is birth <laughs> when the child leaves right when, as soon as that baby comes out as soon as we come out of our mother we've been totally dependent for every single thing um and we have to breathe on our own Mm. So I, in you know, I love that that it's a it's a it's a journey of little independences. It's not it's not something that you just arrive at, you know, through nothing. It's your experiences and your relationship with that those first primary carers mm. that are going to lay the foundation. You know, we talk a lot about the first three years laying the foundation for all future development. So for independence, for socialization, for mental health, um, for emotional resilience, all of those things, the foundation is laid in that first nurturing relationship we have with adults. And that's why it's such a crucial time to, to be aware of that dynamic ourselves with our little children um that they are separate from us it's a degree of separation Mm. continually from that time and we have to prepare ourselves for it as much as we prepare them for it Mm. because that's where the troubles come in is when we are emotionally dependent on our child for certain things where we should be getting that nurture elsewhere and vice versa Mm, that's a hard thing as a mother, isn't it? Because especially for mums, if you're you've carried the child, nurtured the child, delivered the child, spent months breastfeeding the child, you know, and so really, you know, I never thought about well, before I had my own child, I always thought, oh, you know, you just carry on with your life and I'm just going to be this woman that does, <laughs> and that doesn't happen. <laughs> ah, so, you know, um, I can really understand how a lot of people get attached and find it hard to break that attachment. Talk to us about that. You know, what is a healthy, because we've gone through this thing of like now it's all about attachment parenting and, you know, <laughs> a little cringe there. I mean, you know, wow, what, you know, I, what's happened with Shanti and I is Shanti's very independent. So it's just her personality. And so she has always made the decisions of when she's going to stop breastfeeding. She just walked off and was like, that's it, I'm done. You know, she's very independent. <laughs> she went to preschool yesterday. I dropped her off for stage one orientation yesterday and she didn't even say goodbye to me. She just walked through the door. <laughs> so it's going to depend on the personality of your child, right? <laughs> but also the personality of your parent. Like I'm a very independent person. So talk to us about attachment the attachment parenting is I feel like it's almost like gone the complete opposite way of what our parents did I don't know you know and I'm not going to say that I know a lot about attachment parenting but let's talk a little bit about that and I suppose if somebody would ask me do I believe in attachment parenting yes we do need to be attached to our children healthily through every stage of their development because they always going to need us but how they need us changes mm. And we need, again, that preparation, that, that emotional preparation because, as you say, we have carried them for nine months and then give birth to them in labour. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. And then we feel totally, especially depending on what our life was before that, we feel like we often fill everything in our life with our children the first We have to, you you know, you have to sacrifice that first year. You have to put yourself on hold. There's no way you nurture and get all the same time that you used to to sit and read a book or go and exercise or, you know, have a dinner that lasts for three hours because you're constantly on call, right? 
And then it's and it's important that we realize that the second year needs less of that and the third year needs less of that and the fourth year needs less of that, you know, um, because if you think of it, I mean, Maria Montessori said that a child is a person of their place and time by the time they are three and all they have to do is grow in stature. So we've got this very short period where they are totally within our sphere of influence without little influence from out there. So it is important that they, you know, the home is always going to be the most important thing. We all look back to our home and the way it was or wasn't to get our bearing in life. Mm, We do, don't we? You know, whether it, you know, to whatever degree it, it met our needs or didn't, it is our frame of reference, you know, and, um, that's why I think we should really, I suppose, um, be grateful for it, um, whatever it was. And um, and the first, you know, watching little children, they are so capable. When you spend a lot of time with babies and toddlers, um, you know, they are so responsive to relationship right from the beginning. That is That is what they're calling out for right from the beginning is relationship. You know, um, the sound of a human voice is what they turn to. You know, they don't respond to animal voices. <laughs> you know, they don't respond to the barks and the meows and that. They respond to a human voice. Mm. So, you know, um, the key is, ob- I think, learning to be observers. I think we are observers as mothers, spe- you know, especially. Um, but to actually do it much more objectively is healthy. Um, I think I've mentioned to you before that having um, fostered children and that you are, you do become more self-aware of how subjective you are um, the children who came out of you compared to other people's children, you know, in terms of, oh, I don't want them to turn out like this, I don't want them to turn out like that, and, we, and that kind of guides how we're parenting them, mm-hmm. whereas... You know, you accept other children for who they are and you much more, I need to get to know this child. What do you think that comes from? Is that because we, we feel like our identity is in the child? You know, this child is an extension of me and if you're, you know, I mean, it's a very old, some cultures and some generations, well, you know, I want my child to be a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, and that's the purpose. <laughs> you know, there's... It is very interesting, you know, why people, you know, it is, it is an inborn desire to continue, to, to continue, you know. Yeah. Most people do have that desire to have children based on maybe very selfish needs, mm. um, you know, to explore the reasons why we have children is a whole other subject, I suppose. But it is, we do see them in, as an extension of ourselves, I think. Many, many, um, you'll hear a lot of people saying, oh, well, you know, they just, they're living out their dreams through their children now because their dreams weren't accomplished, you know. They weren't allowed to play tennis when they were growing up, so now they buy their child a tennis racket at 18 months, you know, and put them on the, you know. So... We there is that sense, um, which is unfortunate in us, you know, that we are trying to get our worth through what our children now mm. achieve. And it also comes back to it, doesn't it? Like with Dr. Shafali talks about my child. The illusion is that you are this is my child, my daughter, my, 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 my belongs to me. And this is an illusion because the child never belongs to us in the first place. She talks about that, hey. Yeah. We, you know, from, from I suppose, the, a biblical sense or a sense that everybody is worth something, you know, worth, worth self-worth is really important. Mm-hmm. And um, the fact that, yeah, children are lent to you. They don't belong to you. They lent to you for a season. You know, that is the season where they're totally dependent on you is very short, really, you know, in comparison to their whole life journey. Um, And we were just talking about even adult children, you've got to learn to let go and not have that sense of why have they become like that? You know, 
why do they dress like that? Why do they wear their hair like that? As if somehow you should have dictated what kind of hairstyle they like. And I hear a lot of parents, you know, talking about their children still as he's like this and he's like that and he needs this and he needs that, you know. And you think, well, really? Do you know that? What's this sense? It is that sense of knowing, isn't it? Like you, you should know what's best for your child. Yeah, but do we? Hmm. Especially, you know, don't we? So that's where I think that whole thing right from the beginning. Are we growing up children who are free to be them and I'm nurturing what they're supposed to become, not what I think they should become? It's a subtle change. It's a subtle change. It's just like, you know, it's the subtle change of thinking that they don't belong to me, they lent me. If something's lent to you, you usually are much more careful with it. Mm, oh, so true. <gasps> so true. I never thought of that before. But yeah. when you borrow something, you actually, like, make sure nothing happens to it. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas if you think it's yours, you think, oh, I can do whatever I don't want. Mm. And so, maybe that's the change. Mm, such an interesting concept. So I was very interested in Montessori and when we mentioned that Fern's a Montessori educator and this is not to, this talk is not to convince you to turn to the Montessori method. No. What we, what, what attracted me to it was because of my background in movement and understanding the um, importance of brain development in movement and also movement being our first way of communication before we have language. Mm. Um, so that's the first place to me where, um, self-regulation starts and autonomy but also understanding the mind-brain connection and then also of course because I work so much with adults in the rehab space and we take them back to infant development patterns for the rehabilitation journey understanding the importance of proper infant development in terms of movement for the body the bones and the structure and all of the function and that so that's what drew, drew me to Montessori um, and that's how the envir Montessori environment is set up. Let's just talk about that. I think is the first place to start because it's really interesting in that because most of us, and this is still a concept obviously to a lot of people that's bizarre because I'm still seeing on social media kids in jolly jumpers and kids in those walker things. If, if everyone has a jolly jumper, please throw it out. <laughs> please throw it out. Like, I can talk about it from a development perspective, but I can talk about it from what is happening to your spine, bouncing and bouncing and crushing itself and the hip joints that haven't been formed properly. So from a movement perspective, please throw it out. But um, <laughs> You've just, my passion movement from mo movement equals learning, movement equals learning right from the beginning. It, the more we restrict movement, the more we restrict brain development. And, oh, yeah, maybe this is what grew us to each other because, I, you know, I made a movie of my granddaughter's, my first grandchild's first year. We videoed her every week. And so it's, you know, autonomy is all about what the, the parent is prepared not to do for their child. Mm, that's such an interesting way to put it, and it's so true, actually. What are you prepared not to do to help them, to allow them to struggle because learning happens in struggle? Like every time your child is crawling around and you prevent them from getting to the edge of the step so they can't even look to see that it's dangerous or that they need to retract from it, you are making them dependent on you to learn about the world instead of giving them knowledge about where they can go and what their limitations are. So I love the crawling one and the step one because it really illustrates to parents how we try and save them mm. from difficulty and then expect them to have emotional resilience in difficulty. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And people don't realise that's the foundation, right? And it's the same thing with boredom, I guess, right? Because we're always like, you know, even when I, my girl couldn't move, if people bring these toys that are so colourful and immobile with 20 million things on it. And, you know, it's, it's like I feel like it's, oh, my God, what happens if the child gets bored? Yes. So we're <laughs> overstimulating them. Um, uh, you know, 
somebody's just made the little kicking ball for my granddaughter who's only four weeks old and so we take we've been taking pictures of her this week at four weeks just looking at the ball and you see most parents are really um, motivated to move it and jangle it and you know actually overstimulate you know thinking that that is what relationship is whereas really if you sit and watch a four week old discover the ball it's a totally different experience yeah. where you don't even draw their attention to the ball you just have it <clears throat> an angle where they would notice it as soon as they get it in their right because children have peripheral vision if you put it at 45 degrees and 30 centimeters away just like the breast is from their mom, mom's face mm. they will start to focus on it and then the wind might move it very slowly so they get a different angle. And so eye tracking can begin really young if given objects that move slowly, whereas most of the mobiles, as you say, they, they've got, um, they're very colourful, they have too many objects, they often have music attached to them, so they're distracting from the actual um, object that the child's looking at. So... You know, right from the start, we start overstimulating them and actually stopping them from concentrating. Meanwhile, concentration is the thing we want to develop. It's very interesting when you think about what Dr. Christine Goodwin and I are talking about. You know, we have this obsession with devices and, you know, st- we're, we're so overstimulated at, as adults. And that place of boredom, you know, she talked about if we don't get bored, we have no idea who we are. And we are so overstimulated that we're pushing that onto our children as well. So you're like, oh, it's just lying there. I better get him a toy. Or, you know, oh, he made a noise. I better get that rattle that he can't reach. And, you know, <coughs> it's this is where it starts. Yes. And it's. I guess it would be very challenging. Like it is challenging, you know, even for me who's conscious of these things, to sometimes just sit and watch and be present when you're normally in this world of like, okay, I've got to do, 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 do. I've got to get the shopping. I've got to do this thing for a client. Da, da, da. But to actually go, oh, okay, I'm with my daughter now. I'm not going to take any action. I'm not going to control anything. I'm just going to sit here. Like it takes a lot, even for me, who's conscious of that. Yeah, it does take a lot because there's a sense that if I'm not doing something, I'm not parenting, mm. you know. Um, so a lot uh, yeah, a lot of what I talk about, especially with mums with under threes, is you know that less equals more. If you're doing if you're if you sit back, you'll be able to do what you really should do. But whereas when you're thinking you have to fix things and make things, you know, get your child back to happy and you know, we are like control freaks really in terms of wanting to make life perfect instead of sitting back and going I wonder if they can actually solve that problem without me saying anything um you know and that's why I love Montessori education really is about the adult realizing that there's a that their role is not to do stuff to the child it's to put the right environment there for the child so that they will take what they need from the environment to become who they need to be. And that is a very, it's a mind shift. It's a dynamic mind shift, but realising that this dynamic, and it really has helped me as a parent, especially, you know, parenting teens and even adult children now, that this dynamic, that, that my role is really about more being observant of my child, my own children as well as the children I educate, and seeing what is missing in the environment that I can help put into the environment that the child is naturally going to develop. Because children naturally develop in an environment that's prepared for them. And so, you know, if that's just such a change of thinking that you can be objective enough to stand back and say, well, is it something in me that's hindering my child? Is it something because the environment isn't offering the right thing? Or is my child need glasses? 
That's, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, because that's why they can't see the board. So it's always, it's, it's not just the child. And instead of us thinking that we have to act on this child all the time and be there for this child all the time um, is actually where we go wrong, I think, you know, in terms of, of, as you say, controlling them, having them as an extension of ourselves mm. instead of sitting back and going, this child is lent to me for this period of time where I have an awesome responsibility to um, give them or, you know, be there for them, but not um, be there for them from them deciding how much they need of me rather than the other way around. Mm, It's a real lesson, lesson in presence and patience, right? And I think one of the reasons, you know, I've noticed with myself when I go to a place of like I need to control this, it's when I'm, uncomfortable with how it affects me or it brings up like I noticed with my daughter I could bring up a reflection of how I feel about the way I was raised and that's what the challenge is for me so if she's doing something you know my I've a lot of respect for my mother she was a single mother you know she raised two of us on her own she worked you know and she grew up in Asia (laughs) in a traditionally Indian Sri Lankan culture right so very different from how I would go so I have a lot of empathy for her because she's had to really break away from you know she got locked in a in a room but wasn't allowed to talk to anyone when she got her period right because it's unclean so this is a very different culture that she's come from so I have a lot of patience for that but there's still a part of me that's like wow I was I was treated so strictly and you know so I don't you know i don't want to do the same to my daughter but when I find I'm in those moments of stress I'm like oh my god <laughs> but I think they're the moments of learning right yeah they're the moments of learning so let's talk about um these moments because the first thing I learned which I wasn't expecting to learn from Montessori was how we talk to our children in terms of praise and it's an interesting thing, right, because now when I'm at the, pri- the playground, I hear so many parents say, oh, good climbing, oh, good walking, good sharing, good, good. We've become so like I don't want my child to think they're naughty or, you know, we've gone the other way and we don't want them to feel neglected, so I need to praise them all the time. But you taught me so many amazing things about praise and not praising and the implications of praise. So please would you share with us about the good, and, you know, Josh talked about in his, his talk, you know, there's no such thing as a bad child, no bad child. Let's, let's talk about this concept of good and bad and praise. I suppose the whole good, bad thing comes from the punish, punishment reward model, mm. that we reward good behaviour and we punish, you know, call it bad behaviour or behaviour that we don't, want to nurture right yeah. um so and so that but whenever we evaluate something is not good or bad they are self-worth they worthy because they are human being you know and we all succeed and fail so we shouldn't be defined by our successes or our failures mm. we should be defined by how worthy we are as human beings right and so the good and bad the, the praise thing, it seems to be ingrained in us to think of good behaviour as good and bad behaviour as bad and the same with our emotions. Good feelings are good and bad feelings are bad. We have to get our children away from the bad feelings and <laughs> have good feelings. But is that reality? No, we all have all feelings, right? Even they exist together in us. We can be angry about something, sad about something else and really excited about the fact that we're going on holiday next week, you know, all at the same time. And so what is this obsession we have as parents where we think that as soon as my child's sad or mad or jealous, we have to get them back to, we have to fix it somehow. Mm. And I think so that, that is the first, I suppose, aha moments we have to have as a parent to even start doing it slightly differently because it's a generation even more so than our, you know, my generation and then even your generation about this being hooked on praise and constant vigilance. You know, I've been speaking to mums, almost every single person that came to my online workshop has 
monitors, not only in the child's bedroom, but anywhere where the child spends time so that we can constantly watch them, so that we can constantly make sure they're okay, so that we can constantly prevent anything bad happening to them. Um, and, you know, I go, seriously, would you as an adult want to be watched while you sleep? Mm, it's been, Wouldn't it's you suffer. start doing funny things to <laughs> perform for somebody if they were constantly checking on you? Well, you it's know? really interesting with the baby monitors, right, because I've never had one, but we've actually got, a, we're going to have a building biologist hopefully on the show and, we, and one of her, she had to find something that emitted the most EMFs possible for her PhD paper and the thing that she found more than a mobile phone was a baby monitor. So oh, you don't want that thing in your common knowledge. That's yeah. Not common knowledge. They admit the e- emit the most EMF of all devices in your house. So and you put that right next to your baby. <laughs> the 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 thing is that babies are born like it's a misunderstanding because human beings are born to make their needs known. Mm. You know, they cry even as they come out. God, this world is very different from the world I just came from. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, but then if you have a baby who sleeps all the time and who's quiet all the time, that's a good baby. You know, people ask you, oh, is she a good baby? I mean, what does that even mean? Exactly. So we have the, you know, we have these misconceptions right from the beginning um, and all the sleep, I suppose, um, things that, there are some really strict um, methods out there about, you know, where and then people, yes, as you say, are praised when their baby's sleeping through from six weeks or whatever, and then they say they've slept through from six weeks. Well, I doubt that there's any baby in the world that slept through from six weeks because they teeth, mm. they have uncomfortable tummies. You know, they, um, yeah, I, I, I just don't think it's the whole truth. You know, we, we, you know, like somebody said to me, who came to me for toileting help this last week, if one more mother says that they toileted their child in three days, I'm going to scream. Yeah. <laughs> because it's like the birth story. It becomes yeah. you share what you want to remember, you know, um, and you're very selective in that. You, you know, you put on your own um what becomes so this there's a lot of shame around that stuff right and this is the thing with good and bad I mean I remember even when I went to mother's group and I shared my birth story and I had such an amazing birth and the the midwife and mother's group she said I wouldn't tell too many people that that you loved your birth because and that you know it was pain-free this beautiful meditative hypno but all this sort of stuff I wouldn't tell too many people that so we've got good and bad but we've got this you're not allowed to even be authentic in case it offends somebody. Well, that's it. And this isn't this what good and bad starts. It's it's it, it's. I mean, you taught me that when we when we let's just go through how you know when a child does something, and this yeah. is the biggest thing that I've had to get over. I was like not saying good girl. This is what you taught me. What Montessori told me. Oh, you know, it's not when your child finally learns to wash their hands and you've been banging your head against the wall with COVID every time you go outside, please wash your effing hands. When they finally walk into the house, wash their hands by themselves, come out, we don't say, oh, good girl, you washed your hands. It's just saying, oh, you washed your hands all by yourself. Yeah. And the difference in that, and can you explain okay. the phrase so, and why yes. we do it that way? Because it's was so... Praise actually is evaluation. And when we are evaluated, we have to compare ourselves. Mm. So we are always think, you know, you know, praise like a word good. If you're a good girl, what you have to look outside there to see good compared to what? Right? And it's the same with bad. So usually when we evaluated, we actually are immediately comparing ourselves or looking for what that means because what does good mean? What is a good, like if you say, if you be good in the supermarket, we can go for a treat. So now you've got the, so what does good mean? Not standing up once in the trolley, being silent so that mommy can 
get the things without being distracted? Like, what does it mean? Mm. There, there's no definition of what good actually means. It's based on how the adult's feeling that day and how much they can cope with, you know, <laughs> rather than, you know, the rule is we sit in the trolley because when you stand up and mommy's distracted, there's the possibility of falling out or, you know, so we don't give information. So, so helpful praise or encouragement describes rather than evaluates. So what you just shared about the bathroom story with washing hands, when you say you washed your hands, look how clean they are. I can even see them shining, right, for instance. Um, and they smell so good, you ask, the child will say, hmm, I'm a good hand washer. Mm -hmm. So the self-praise follows the description. And when I praise myself, I'm intrinsically motivated. So important. There is, when you praise me, I'm extrinsically motivated. I have to look to see if mommy's pleased with me, daddy's pleased with me, the teacher's pleased with me, and then that will define whether I'm a good person or a bad person. Mm. And what about all the things we miss that our children do? If they don't know how to self-evaluate, then they're not getting that positive feedback all the time that they are okay because it's all dependent on the times when we are present enough to actually notice anything, you know, and the fact, and this is what I, you know, in the classroom when I got parents to step back and not be constantly saying good, wonderful, clever, beautiful, whatever, then they were obviously, then they would step back so far back that they're not even noticing what the children are doing and describing it and giving the feedback that is helpful. Because we don't know how to do things, we're either doing too much or too little. Mm. You know, we go, oh, okay, that means I'm, I'm just supposed to let them be and so I'll just go on my phone for the next hour. <laughs> so it's like we, we, we swing this pendulum instead of realising that we can give really helpful feedback, but it doesn't have to be constant. It, just, we, it can be just, look, wow, you look you look really pleased with yourself about that. You looks like you like red. That picture's just got red, red, and more red. <laughs> you know? um, so it's it's such a subtle difference, isn't it? And yet it makes I've seen babies who take the step, a step for the first time, and everything. When you say hard work, standing and falling, and standing and falling, and standing and falling, and you did that big step. Or, you know, all by yourself. You should see the pride with which their whole body. Oh, you, you do. Know, oh, that's, that's, I, I love it. Shanti's face when she comes out and she's, you know, I did it. Like putting on a T-shirt for her, putting on her jumpers and a T-shirt is her latest thing, you know. is She's been battling with it for such a long time. And I have to say this is the part, right, where it's hard because you're like, will you just bloody hurry up and get ready? <laughs> and so the... The, the desire is to do it in a time frame that suits you and it takes a lot to go, okay, so I know that getting dressed in the morning takes forever and it's a real sticking, like this is our sticking point at the moment, getting a T-shirt on by yourself. So my thing is, right, so what I have to do as a parent is make space for that to happen so I have to be organised. In So actually while we've been doing this process, we're not choosing clothes ourselves. I get the clothes out and lay them out so she can come and put the hands in and do it. So we can just focus on that piece. But it, what it calls is that I have to be organised as a parent. Oh, and I get, have to give you a different method of how to put a T-shirt on later <sighs> from uh, just hearing what you said. I can always learn more, hey. I can always yeah. learn more and this is yeah. the thing. Is that it's very frustrating because you think, oh, now I'm doing this right, but I could do this better. And this is the, I think it's the part, right, where the ego steps in and you're like, well, I'm the adult and I should know how to do this better. And then the other part that steps in is like, well, can you just hurry them up because we've got to get in the car and get to school and I need to be on time. So it's constantly self-evaluating what works for your family, you know, how does this 
you know, and that's the challenging part, right? It's taking the time to set up the environment for the child because they constantly change as well, right? So, oh my goodness. So it's like, okay, well, now she can do this. So now I've got to move the dressing chair here in front of the mirror, the here, and, you know, it, it's constantly going, is this actually working for her? Am I facilitating an environment where she can actually learn to get dressed herself? You know, um, it's often, really interesting. Often it's just what you've just said is that we're not children. We, they need time, but they need to have, have observed the steps in the process. Mm. Because the way we put on the T-shirt is so fast. And just what you said about mirror neurons, I, I just start looking that up because it was a very interesting concept to me. But they do what we do, not what we say. Mm-hmm. So we'll say, slow down, look what you're doing. Da, 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 da. But they watch us and we don't, we move at a very hectic speed. So especially when we dress, like, and when we dress them. And for however long we've been dressing them before we um, think, oh, they can dress themselves. Or, I should, you know, in Montessori you might be, you know, in, as a Montessori parent you introduce that from a lot younger. I mean, you meet people who will, are still dressing a four- and five-year-old and have never thought anything else of it because they're little and you dress them. Mm. And you help them to dress and they don't show the skills that they've got it because you've been doing it so fast. <laughs> so, But this they- is also novel to me, right, because in the world where we come from, it's all about protecting the child, right? So there's all these things to stop the child falling off the change table and you distract the child and you, um, it's never, what, I, what was really key for me in Montessori as well was learning that when a child is, you know, trying to climb off the change table or trying to, it's an opportunity to for you to give them some change kind of involvement. Yeah, change the environment and get them involved. You know, who would think that you could say to a six-month-old baby, do you want to hold the wipe for me or do you want to, you know, give, like get them involved in what you're doing because that's actually laying the foundation for them to learn how to do it themselves. Well, not only that, it develops their concentration skills because in order for you to do that, you have to slow down and hold the wipe until they take it Mm -hmm. without giving it to them. You know, if you ask a question, you have to wait for a response. And most of us don't even do that, you know. Um, and, And questions are interesting because little children often don't respond to questions. They respond to choices much more than questions, right? You know, red T-shirt or blue T-shirt, they will make a choice. If you say, what T-shirt do you want to wear? Mm. Right? (laughs) I've been doing this with Shanti too. I pick out two outfits and I go, which one do you want to wear? Otherwise, if I say, what do you want to wear? We'll stand there in front of the cupboard for hours. (laughs) Not only that, you literally, as you said, like, there's a whole cupboard. And then if they choose the jumper, you're going to say, no, they can't wear it because it's hot outside, you know. So, you know, we give them, it it has to be age appropriate, the choices, but they do have to develop, you know, to choosing their own clothes Mm. so that they get the sense of what is too warm to wear today. So, you know, holding up to, you know, if you do it from younger, by the time they're a certain age, they will have already the confidence to choose, you know, especially if we it's summer clothes that are available or it's winter clothes that are available. That will help them. How do children make good choices? By having lots of opportunity to make choices, mm. you know. And dressing is one of the first independences because what what happens to old people when they can't dress themselves? Mm. they feel all their self-worth goes because now they're back to dependency on others. And dressing is also the separate, the learning to be see your child as separate from you and them seeing themselves as separate from you because they're going to, if you give them the time, they're going to maybe put on a T-shirt very differently from what you've shown them. And then you have to accept that that's the way they like to put on their T-shirt. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You know, 
instead of dictating not only what should be done, but how it should be done and in what time frame it should be done. Um, it's interesting with the T-shirt, though, because I know that your um, what you've been shown is the arms in something, right? Mm. Have you? Yeah, yeah, put it flat down. So she and then put, put your arms, arms in. in first. Yeah. Well, have you ever put on a T-shirt like that? Yeah, this is really interesting, right, because I've been trying to do it. So That's I put it a Montessori it jacket. Yeah, right. Put it on like that. Yeah, she loves the jacket flip. Oh, my God, you should see her on the step. So, but we can't it's put it on a T-shirt like that. Yeah. <laughs> when we lie on, down a T-shirt, you put it up and the first thing you have to put is in your head. Yeah. So you, she's going to have much more success if you just change that one thing. The head. Oh, thank you. I'm going to try that this morning. So, you know. And but she, you know what? She can do it herself now. It's really gorgeous. <laughs> but I feel bad now. I've given her the hard way to do it. I will have to give you the link to um, my toileting resources page where my three-year-old grandson is dressing himself. We've got a video on there. Oh, uh, Good. Well, this is the thing, right? So toileting, let's talk about toileting as well, because we sort of see these things, I think, as parents as like when it's when you're three, you have to go to school. So you should be able to go to the toilet. So we'll just stay in for the weekend that you're, you know, before you turn three, we'll all stay home. And by the end of the weekend, you'll go to the toilet. And I think it's the same when parents are older, right? They think, oh, my child is 16 now. They should learn how to cook. Or my child is, you know, 18, they shouldn't learn how to drive. But all these things actually and a lot take of skills before that. Oh, masses of skills. But also the found, building the foundations of these skills is actually quite oh, what's the word? It's a it's a journey that sets you up for autonomy in in a very profound way. Yes. I think. So let's talk about that. And okay. because this I think you know what I learned about this too. I'm I'm talking about it, I guess, from the perspective of when I work with adults who yeah. have these issues with their with their body, like not liking their body, not thinking that part, functions of their body are disgusting. You know, we're still in a world where people can't I ask them, how are your bowel movements? And they're like, oh, what are you asking me that for? And I'm, well, your bowels actually tell you about your diet, you know. How's your period? Oh, I don't want to talk about periods. Well, your period actually tells you a lot about your physiological function. You know, we're still icky about those things. Yeah. Um, and we are still funny about our bodies. And also, you know, we have parent adults who can't do things for themselves <laughs> that have issue taking responsibility, like cooking for themselves. Or, you know, it's a really interesting. And I think, I feel like from what I've learned from you, from Montessori, that this actually starts from zero to three, right? Yeah. And unfortunately, right, it's the unconscious learning period of our lives. So most of us as adults, you know, have consciously we can't remember what was done to us around toileting. Um, but unconsciously we're responding out of what's being done to us in all manner of things. Right? Mm. And toileting, the ability to take care of your own physical needs in a bathroom is one of the big milestones which I believe from the working with children this long and knowing historically, you know, uh, how early toileting is possible for them to do themselves, um, that is hindering this ability to separate and this emotional dependence that we're seeing in the three to six age group because this issue of looking after their own body functions hasn't been totally resolved by the time they're heading off out of the home environment and spending more and more time. Like by the time they're three, they're spending three to six hours away from you, you know, most children. So if they are not autonomous in terms of being able to go to the toilet, being able to self-regulate, being able to actually read the signs that their body needs to do this, that means everything is affected. Because we all know how hard it is when a toilet isn't available as an adult. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. and if you're not confident to go to a toilet or to ask an adult to assist you with what you can't do independently for yourself yet, then you are holding on to body function and that is becoming a learned pattern of behavior right from little. 
mm. right, that there's something wrong with me or there's something, you know. Um, by the time a child's three, they're also aware of other children and what they can do and what you can't do. So it starts to have social impacts, it, you know, whereas an 18-month-old who's learning to go to the toilet, nobody's looking at them. They don't, you know, nobody's saying you should be able to do this or you shouldn't be able to do that. And so they are learning more at the right time. It's like language. I say to parents, well, did you just start talking to your child at two and expect them to have language? Mm. You know, we do, uh, we start talking to our child from birth, trusting that by the time they two, that will become an explosion of language, right? And yet we do nothing about toileting and expect them to have all these scaffolding skills and self-confidence to just do it in the three days um, without any self-knowledge. And disposable nappies have certainly complicated the issue because they've made it too easy for parents not to pay attention for a long time and then they don't deal very well with me- the mess that toileting can um, produce. Um, and so they are not prepared. The biggest thing with the toileting is I'm talking to the parents about preparing themselves mm. for something that's a normal stage of development that they have to pay attention to. They can't, you know, they think training pants train their child. Like, what have pants got to do with training children? You see, I mean, the whole, the, the actual whole media thing about, I mean, pull-ups, you know, Pull up, strain your child, you know, change them from a, that kind of diaper to one that they – pull-ups are the hardest things to get on for a child. They can't get them on, on their own. So, yes, yeah, so all of those things, it's, it's, it's really tough because dressing, like you said, gives them a lot of self-confidence. The ability to dress and undress, and a child is very capable of dressing themselves be, before 18 months if they've had enough practice. And it's and it's something that I've seen boosts their autonomy and independence, and I can do it. There's nothing like dressing, you know. So the collaborative dressing, as you said, you know, as soon as they they fighting on a change table, they are voicing a need for change as loudly as possible, and it's up to the parent to change the environment. The child can't change the environment. Mm-mm. You know, they and they will adapt to whatever environment the child, the parent gives them. So, you know, I've watched a mother dress a nine-year-old after a swimming lesson at the swimming pool, and he literally was like a rag doll. Mm. So, you know, and then you think, well, um, you know, what kind of adult? We must always be thinking, what kind of adult would this make this child in what I'm doing for them right now? Well, that's key, isn't it? Because we think of it so much as you know, giving them academic success or financial success and that will make them the adult and whereas it's really about teaching them the values and teaching them to self-regulate, which is what people have the most issues with when they come to see me is self-regulation, listening to yourself, self-worth, um, self-reflection, self, you know, um, looking at your own emotions, stopping to think about how I feel about something, being able to hang out with myself by myself, you know, being able to achieve something for my own desire, not for, you know, the recognition of the world, the universe. And, you know, the huge one like you're talking about is self-comparison, like always comparing myself to everyone else in the world for a barometer of where I'm at in my life. And these are all the things I think that really undo us as adults. Yeah, there there are. And, um, you know, I mean, we haven't really touched on the whole thing of of emotions, which, you know, we d- we want to not accept emotions instead of realizing that by accepting them, by naming them, we don't agree with them. We're just accepting them, and accepted emotions actually diminish. Whereas when you deny emotions and say stop crying, or you know oh, you're okay, you're okay when a child falls down, that we're actually stopping the very mechanism that helps people be what you are talking about, Mm -hmm. self-regulating. 
um, you know, I mean, emotional intelligence is the ability to identify, access, and control your own emotions mm-hmm. and to, um, yeah, I've got it written up here, recognize, understand, and consider the emotions of others. So if you don't know what emotions you're feeling, how do you access them? Mm. How do you identify emotions that you've never named, that nobody's ever named for you? Like, you know, I talk a lot about jealousy and anger as the emotions parents don't want to um, name. You know, it's stop being angry, you know. Um, You know, tantrums are bad, right? Mm. (laughs) Yet everyone has them. Yeah, adults have them. (laughs) They just learn to disguise them in different ways, right? And so we're trying to always um, stop emotions instead of just the understanding that emotions accept to diminish and that we all behaviour is preceded by emotion, all behaviour. Child psychology would tell you that all behavior is preceded by emotion. So if we can tune into the emotions of our children and accept them and only put a limit on actions, because we all need to control our emotions, right? You can't live in a world where you just let your emotions hang out wherever you are because they affect other people. But if you can't identify them and access them, you can't learn to control them. No, exactly right. If you're told to push them down every time you're angry, you know, and, and boys, you know, especially in generations previously, you know, you're not allowed to be angry. Instead of saying, you know, anger is a legitimate emotion, as legitimate an emotion as happiness, because it wouldn't be viable for us to be not angry if somebody did something really bad to us, you know. If we were just like, well, oh, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be authentic. Well, that's the thing people would need to understand about emotion as well is that, you know, anger is a very healthy emotion for setting boundaries. And people who can't access their anger often have issues with boundaries and protecting themselves, standing up for themselves. Right. And, you know, so if we don't allow our children to be angry, let's talk about that, how we actually help a child access that because that was a real important thing that you taught me. Okay, so, I mean, I think anger, you know, the thing with emotions is that they just happen, right, as a response to something that's been done to us. You know, sometimes it's a violation of our boundaries, but sometimes it's just something that we want that somebody else isn't letting us have, right? Um, But, you know, by allowing them the anger, we allow them to learn to control it. But by stopping the emotion, it usually gets worse and worse and worse, doesn't it? Mm. I mean, the more we try and um, interact with a child having a tantrum, usually the tantrum ends up in us both having a tantrum. (laughs) Cover it. You know, um, the worst tantrum that you've ever seen in the shopping centre, at the end, who's tantruming? (laughs) Because we haven't just allowed the feelings to exist without us wanting to control and stop and fix. And as a result, our own anger boils over the top, you know. And or we say yes to our children over and over again when we really should have said no. And now Mm. we can't control our own emotion. So allowing emotion to just exist and then like letting them feel it for as long as they have to feel it mm. is is probably where I would start with the negative feelings. Um, you know, jealousy is another big one that exists, you know, right from the start. As soon as our, if we only have one child, child, they're jealous of us having conversations. They're jealous of our friends, mm. you know. I'll never forget how my granddaughter's little face used to. Every time she used to spend time with me and I used to be with my adult friends, she would stand beside me like, (laughs) I don't like that lady, Granny. I don't like that lady. You get so jealous when I'm talking to my friend that I'm not paying you all the attention, don't you? And then she would just like smile, you know? Yeah. 
But, you know, like if you just said, don't be, don't be like that. Don't be nasty about my friends. Don't do this. Don't do that. What don't happens to interrupt me to emotion? <laughs> you know, what happens to, and it is embarrassing if your child, if your friend's standing right there and your grandchild's going, don't talk to her, you know. It is embarrassing and we usually act out of our emotions mm. instead of responding to what's necessary, which is just an acceptance of none of us like to not be the centre of attention, right? And so jealousy is a normal emotion that's legitimate in that instant. It doesn't make the child bad to be jealous. Mm-hmm. But it is that uh, acknowledgement, right, stopping and asking why is my child behaving like that rather than, oh, that's not appropriate so I'm going to stop you from doing that. Well, the why often isn't helpful because, like, could you answer if I say why are you happy about this, mad about that? Oh, true, so true. Okay, so that is the thing that parents ask. Like, if, if I'm asked why... If, if you get angry and your husband says, why are you angry? Why did that make you angry? And you're like, I hate that. <laughs> no, the fact is you get angrier. Yeah. If you're not accepted. So true. And yet when we, we, we think that, like, why is going to fix the bad feeling? Mm. Well, why, why is just because? The answer is because. Yeah. Oh, I'm still so stuck in my How can you explain <laughs> because, I mean, you know, like why were you embarrassed when, why were you embarrassed when the guy cut you off and swore at you? Why were you embarrassed? I mean, I, I was just embarrassed, I guess. Yeah, or, you know, can I lie down on your couch for two hours and we'll try and dissect it together, like therapy, you know. So true, I didn't even think of that. But I think so this is the mistaken thing yeah. because of our belief about feelings. Yeah. And instead of they just are, and what we need to control limit is our, the actions we take with our feelings. So I can be angry at you, but I have to find a way to tell you about that anger without attacking you and without, because the anger is mine to take responsibility for. It's not because of you. Yeah. And this is the whole thing that we blamed other people for our emotions. So somehow we have to fix them and then we won't have these emotions. Yeah. You know, and yet the thing is I have to take personal responsibility for what makes me angry is different from what makes you angry. And, you know, so it all starts with personal responsibility. And if I take responsibility, personal responsibility for my feelings, it will follow that I take personal responsibility for my actions. Mm -hmm. So true. So I think, you know, when we go back to mirror neurons, it talks about, you know, this is where we have to do it ourselves, right? Like I think I was telling you the story, someone stole our pram off our front doorstep and I was so, I was ropeable. I was ropeable. I was like, Anyway, it's my fault for leaving it out there. But I didn't notice for a week that someone stole it. I thought the nanny had taken it. I thought, you know, I was like, where's this pram? I didn't realise. Then I had to use this, you know, I didn't want to buy another pram. I thought my daughter's too old. I'm not spending money on another pram. So I've got this secondhand, you know, I don't know, terrible cheap stroller and I couldn't open it. And one morning we were running late and I couldn't open it and I was so angry. (laughs) And Shanti's standing there watching me and, you know, this has been a key thing for me as a parent just to learn to voice myself when I'm going through something and explain myself so she can understand rather than just, so I've got this pram and I really just wanted to throw it on the footpath. And instead I put it down and I said, oh, my God, I'm so angry. And Shanti said to me, why are you angry, Mummy? I said, somebody stole our pram and now I have to use this one and I can't. Use it. I can't open it. I'm so frustrated because I can't open it. (laughs) And she says to me, she's not, I think she must have just turned to, she said to me, Mummy, come here. I'll I'll cuddle you. I'll I'll cuddle you. Now sit down, sit down. Take a deep breath. Then we open it together, she said. (laughs) And, And this is the power of accepted emotion. People cannot respond when they feel like when we, when we accept feelings, people can think. 
You know, it's the same with the, you can't reason with an emotional person. Even us, we can't be reasoned with when we in the height of emotion. Mm. The emotions have to recede for us to be able to think clearly, you know. So when you understand that that's okay, listen, I can't talk right now, you know, I, I'll scream at you if I talk right now. So can I be left alone until I'm ready to talk in my normal voice? <laughs> it's, it's a very healthy way to, to show children how to regulate their emotions. You know, the fact that you didn't scream, like the fact that you used your body to express your emotion rather than, you know, a attacking the people that stole the pram, right? How can there be such bad people in the world? Now they've made me so angry. I've got to do this and I've got to do that because of, instead of the fact is I have no pram, I haven't got the pram that I really love, I've got this other pram and now I'm feeling this. Mm. Yeah, It's a very different, it's the reason why she could show empathy was because you you were authentically expressing emotion just and that's what you were doing that's all you were doing you know and you were using and you were doing it what i say you have to match the emotion of your children you were ma- you weren't going i'm so angry you know you know what i mean you were expressing the the emotion to the degree that you were experiencing the emotion mm. With, and the key is without attacking character. And you didn't attack anybody. You just expressed your emotion. Mm. And you didn't blame anybody else for your emotion. You know, and that is what you, you said, how do we take, get children to take responsibilities for their bodies and their relationships is by being authentic ourselves, is by modeling what we want. You can't teach children. It's... They're going to be doing what you do. Mm. They're going to be handling it the way you handle it. Mm. (laughs) Um, They're observing people all around them. So they're not only going to be watching us, they're going to be watching both of us and they're going to be watching how, you know, how we talk to our friends and how we talk about our friends when they're not there. You know, so they will... They develop their masks from the way we are this way with these people and that way with those people Mm. instead of, you know, I think, you know, I always think of the way mums talk um, about other, other, other women and then realize that, you know, this is what your daughters are watching, how they, you know, if we are comparing our bodies always to other people's women, what are our girls going to be doing? Oh, it's terrible. This is something that's really, I think, I hope all the women listening here, because we're so terrible. And I've really been conscious since I've had Shanti because I'm really not happy with the way I look because I've had an autoimmune disease and I've put on 35 kilos and I have to be so careful not to make a reference. You know, I want to use the F word. (laughs) I really want to use the F word, F-A-T, and I'm really conscious of not saying that in front of her or comparing myself to her. And but then at the same time, it's still a real emotion, right? Um, you know, so, saying, oh, you know, I don't feel good about myself because I wanted to wear this today and I can't wear it. But, you know, it's still important to I think that those we're emotions. About that, because remember, we all have habits, you know, that have developed through through our life of what we haven't taken self response, you know, personal responsibility for. And health and fitness are those two things that we all know what we have to do to get the result we want. Mm. But that translated into actually the actions is difficult for every human on the earth. You know, it's only through and I mean I know I've taken the last year to 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 lose, you know, not even a lot of weight and it takes a lot of conscious effort to change your habits and behaviours and to make things that you really want a priority until you get to the result you want for yourself, not based on anybody else. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, sometimes you avoid doing it because somebody says, oh, but, you know, you look good. 
And then so you go, even though I don't really or I want to be fitter, I don't take those actions because everybody else accepts me the way I am. So we should be, you know, I don't think we need to hide that part of ourselves that gets frust- frustrated and angry with ourselves because, as you said, anger and frustration are actually, you know, the biggest motivators of change. Mm. It's when we get to that point where I really don't want to, to be unfit anymore. I really don't. You know, for me at the moment, I really don't want to have high glucose levels because it will start telling on my, you know, at, at the moment I'm not having the ill effects of high blood glucose levels as a type 1 diabetic. But in 10 years' time, what I'm doing to my body now will have mm. the impact as I get older. You know, so I have to take responsibility for that now if I want a different outcome in 10 years' time, you know. And so you have to get to the point where you stop denying, (laughs) you know, things will just stay as they are if I don't do anything because that's not the truth, Mm. right? So this is that place of being honest about your feelings. Yeah, and being honest, being honest. And, and, you know, and it's not compared to anybody. It's just compared to what kind of – it's the personal responsibility thing again. Mm. So you can say, you know, this happened to me and I, you know, I picked up weight and I did this and I did that and I, and now I have to turn that around by making different choices, mm. you know, or different because it's, it's them watching us go through those struggles. You know, you, you hear of people that never saw their parents fight, for instance, Oh, I've had some of those people in my coaching and they actually cannot have relationship because they think their parents are so perfect. How am I ever going to have a relationship that's as perfect as my parents? I was like, well, they thought. They just did it with the door closed, you know. <laughs> or they, like, maybe they did get on easy. You know, we should be able to to um, be authentic. If mm. we blow it, then we need to apologise. But if the blow-up happened in front of the children, we shouldn't be apologising in secret because then they don't see both sides of it, do they? Mm. So important. Yeah. And, um, and I mean, so I grew up, my, you know, um, Adrian and I, he grew up in a, he had never seen his parents argue. And I grew up with five children and my mom and dad argued continually. <laughs> so as a result, you know, for him, a raised voice was something is majorly wrong in the world. Mm. If you raise your voice at me, then I'm really bad, you know. Um, and so it's really interesting because neither is right, right? Neither, neither hiding all your emotions under the carpet or just expressing them without care of the other people around you are both are on either side of the spectrum. Mm. You know, we blame, you know, everyone else was, you know, if my dad didn't drink, then this wouldn't happen. If that was, if mom didn't shout at dad, then that wouldn't, he wouldn't have done that. You know, so we, we had this whole thing of, you know, everybody, something's the reason why we lose our control instead of um, the sense of, learning how to regulate our emotions by watching healthy models of doing so. And this is also where setting limits comes in, right, because this is the thing, the big learning for me and the big thing I engaged you to help Sean and I was this uh, this thing of, you know, well, we want our children to be who they are and we want to give them freedom and space and all this sort of stuff, but where do you step in and draw the limit? Because, you know, you can't, it's, it's not even about uh, control. I mean, it isn't, it isn't, but it's the thing is that you're still meant to teach them to self-regulate. So it's not, oh, you know, I today I don't feel like this so I'm not doing it. Well, sometimes life happens and you just have to do stuff that you don't want to do, <laughs> you know, and also the issue of not yelling at children. I mean, children go through phases, right, where they just rebel against everything that you say and if you not putting the limit in what kind of adult, like you said, are they going to be if they don't understand there's limits in the world and consequence? So let's talk about, because I think as well, I think people have this perception of Montessori that it's just this free space and, you know, there's no rules and no regulations. And then other people think there's so many rules they can't deal with Montessori. 
Well, how do we set limits? Yeah, it, it's one of the, I suppose, foundational principles of life that for every freedom we have to know. In order to truly be free, we have to know where the boundary is mm. because freedom without responsibility is chaos. So freedom and, and limits or freedom, yeah, freedom and limits lead to self-discipline. You have to have an, to know where a line is to choose not to go over it. Mm. If there's no line, then you are law unto yourself and you cannot, I mean, you cannot cope in a world, you know, because the world, the world requires that we live within the laws and boundaries that work for others because your, your freedom can't impinge on another person's freedom. And your actions can't affect now, And we're seeing this in the world at the moment with COVID where adults are throwing tantrums about losing their freedoms but not really realising that your freedom is, is, has to be in relationship to, to others Mm, exactly you know we're not just free to do what we like because our freedoms impinge on other people and so important to treat other children right like I'm trying to help Shanti with her anger so she gets quite angry frustrated when she can't do something at the moment it's the Lego right and the Lego she's just got it for her birthday she can't put it together she gets so angry and she throws it across the room so I said to her okay I can see that you're angry but it's not okay to throw things. If you need to get out your anger, you can punch this pillow right here. (laughs) So then the anger belongs, it's your anger, you can go through your anger, but you can't do it in a way that affects anybody else. So here is the pillow, punch the pillow. (laughs) So that that is one of the key skills about emotion is to give children creative outlets for it. So And it can be any manner of things. Sometimes they'll get over you offering them only one kind of option you know so we have to that's why it has to be creative because the one time a pillow will suffice but at other times um we might have to go and kick a ball against a wall as hard as we can or we might have to um tear up paper or scribble or you know and i think so the more creative and the more varied our um our, our offers of the creative outlets, um, as long as, as you say, they're acting on an object which can't hurt anybody else, mm. you know. So, yes, you can be angry with mummy because I'm feeding the baby right now, um, but my leg is not full kicking. <laughs> yeah, so, and, your, and your little sibling is not for bashing, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I've dealt with quite a few that, you know, the baby is getting hurt by the older sibling. And then again, they made bad and wrong for hurting instead of the jealousy and the anger, which is absolutely normal, being acknowledged and giving other, giving voice to the feelings means that a child knows those feelings and therefore can then take personal responsibility for them. But if you're told they're bad and wrong, then all you think about is I'm bad and wrong, mm. you know. And and when we angry, we, we think we're bad and wrong, so we don't take personal responsibility for it. We blame others for it mm. instead of going, well, I have this anger issue that, you know, it boils up for whatever reason because I grew up not being allowed to fly. But now I've got to take personal responsibility for it. Mm. No matter where we are, we have to take. You know, we all do inappropriate things when we're angry usually, um, you know, and so we've got to find other ways to express to express the emotions that don't hurt others. And also to learn about other people, right? Like I, we, Sean and I got you on the phone when COVID started because <laughs> we were losing our minds and everybody else in the world who's been stuck in isolation with their child, I'm sure, is losing, has can resonate with this and what was really helpful was when we called you we were talked about setting up spaces in the house so because all of a sudden we're stuck together and it's not okay to just give up to the child's behavior and what the child wants and everything 
what we set up in the house was um, one room is the quiet room <laughs> and the other room is the play room and the loud room and the express yourself room. So when mummy and daddy are sitting in this room and reading, this is the quiet room. <laughs> And if you don't want to be quiet, that's okay. You can go in the other room and do your dancing, your shouting, your playing, whatever it is. But when mummy and daddy sit here, it's the quiet room. Because I think the other thing as parents is we think that we can't actually have anything of our own personal space, our own personal time. And then I feel like when I do that, I'm going to end up martyring like the generation above me, right? Or all women just martyred themselves for their children, the detriment of themselves. And so this was fundamental to me that we can, the, the way you teach people to set limits for self-preservation, self-love, like it's, it's amazing. And Ashanti she goes in that room, she calls it the quiet room. And, but mark my words, if you make noise in that room, she will tell you, Mummy, this is the quiet room. Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's such a powerful tool to be able. Well, healthy boundaries are not something we're born with. We have to develop. <laughs> uh, and through through trial and error, most of us have come to, you know, most of us come to a point of crisis about lack of healthy boundaries before we actually do anything about it, mm. which is unfortunate, right? Because we all have people in our lives that have been able to, for whatever reason, make us say yes, even when we wanted to say no. Um, and that's where they start eroding. Mm. Our boundaries erode whenever we're not authentic to the inner self. So, you know, and and we do that to our children as well. You know, our, our three-year-old says, I, you say, give me a hug, and I, say, I don't want to. Oh, you're making me sad. How often do you hear a parent say, you're making me sad when a child says, I don't want to hug you? Mm, so much, so often. Right? So whereas, you know, that is then already teaching our children that don't be authentic to yourself. Do what other people are asking you to do and then you accept it. Mm. Right? But we feel embarrassed about that stuff too, right? Like I've had to learn with Shanti, if we go somewhere and she doesn't want to say hello to everyone, I was like, well, she just came in the room. She doesn't know you guys. She'll say hello when she's ready. You know, whereas a lot of parents would feel, oh, my, no, we just got here. You have to say hello to everyone. Give auntie a hug, da 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 da, da. you know. Well, again, you know, children are quite perceptive about people. And when we force things like... um and the thing is, a lot of the not saying hello is because suddenly 10 adults are looking at you expecting you to do something. Mm. You know, has she got a good mannered child? Hasn't she got a good mannered child? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we are, as you say, we are embarrassed. So then we kind of force the issue. And then not only the relationship with the people are, is affected, but now with our child, who, you know, it, it's a dizzy spiral right or we give them a label oh well your child is shy no actually <laughs> and then it forces a concept well, on a child right? label actually reinforces behavior um good and bad is not usually helpful even good labels aren't really helpful to children you know um the the last week of the parenting course the communication schools course is the roles we cast them in that's the title of the um, the session, and it's the one that, as parents, we struggle with the most. That we actually, you know, you start with saying that you start the conversation with what roles were you cast in as a child, and it was it's very interesting, you know, when you do the course and the, these people say, well, I was cast as the beautiful one or the clever one. So even positive roles can be very limiting because if, you, if you're the beautiful one, what happens if you have a car accident and you get a scar on your face? Mm. You know, or, you know, at what point do, so, you know, things happen to us and, you know, if you're the clever one, what happens when you fail your maths exam? What, how do you feel about yourself the minute you 
don't meet up to that role that you've been casted. If you're the athletic one and now suddenly you can't play that sport because you've got a bad knee, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Or whatever. So it's 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 the one that you have to grapple with the most that you know, we say things quite flippantly, like our child's the shy one or our child's the sporty one or our child's the this one or the that one. And and they limit a child. If you're creative um, but not sporty, you know, what motivates you to, to go and be part of a team sometime? Mm. You know, because we, we actually live out what people expect of us as well. And and so, um, you know these the roles that we that we just flippantly put out there. You know we call children a little monkey, and then people ask, well, why does he climb on everything? <laughs> We've been calling him a monkey for the year, and he's just living it out. You know, <laughs> it's so true. It is so true. We don't realize what we say and how you know words are. <laughs> so powerful they are so 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 powerful and it's a big thing of mine that I always reiterate words are so powerful the way we use them as adults to each other and especially the way we are with our children because they're so literal you know I'll never forget when I was a child that a teacher I have such a problem with art and Shanti's actually been helping me with my art and what you taught me about sitting and observing and working with her is helping me. Because when I was a child, I was, I was always told in art class what, what I was doing was wrong. And so I just have this, I can feel like my whole body, all my hair stand on end when I have to do art. So, But art is a very therapeutic thing to do. So I've been trying to sit with Shanti and just be creative scribble and put your hand on the paper and see where it goes and understanding this concept of a child and how they see art you know it's about texture it's about color it's about movement it's about coordination it's about all these things you know and so not about the result yeah and I guess what I'm trying to say with this story is that parenting to me is a call to action to deal with yourself it's a spiritual quest because your child copies everything that you do. <laughs> they react to everything that you do and they're a product of the way you talk to them, the way you treat them. And so this has been really key for me with um, the art is just to sit there with her and scribble and not say, oh, you know, it's so hard, right, to go, oh, let's draw a tree. Like, oh, let's draw a star. Like why do you have to draw a specific object? You know, or or name the thing, or what is that? What are you drawing? They're not drawing anything. It's just a blue line, or a grey squiggle, or a yellow dot. It's it's not a thing. You know, it's having a child to me is a practice in presence and giving up of the ego. And I'm not saying it's easy. Like I've, you guys, if you know, I've called on Fern's help many times. <laughs> I've gone, had to go into another room and scream <laughs> many times. You know, I'm not, I'm still learning, but I think this is the key thing for me that parenting is a call to action for yourself yeah. to be a better person. Um, so I guess I want to wrap it up there because I feel like Fern and I could just talk forever and ever and you guys have yeah. <laughs> got other things to do because, you know, there's a couple of things I want to talk about we haven't talked about and that was food because that's a massive problem with a lot of families getting their kids to eat. But um, and more advice on how do we talk to our kids. So what I want to encourage you guys to do is to look up at Fern's website, independentchild.com, and have a look online because Fern's running a lot of online workshops now. And um, And the How to Talk one is coming up. (laughs) Yes. And Fern, so obviously she's a Montessori trained educator, but she's not Montessori focused. So you don't have to send your children to Montessori to work with her. You don't have to believe in Montessori. You don't have to read Montessori. She's actually just teaching you how to be uh, a great parent, no matter what your philosophy is. Um, And also, what was I going to say, I think this is something really great now that firms doing all these online courses especially when there's still a lot of places in the world that are in lockdown homeschooling stuck with your kids <laughs> you know it's intense and I think for me what COVID was 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 a chance to even step up higher to the plate 
like, okay, now all of a sudden Shanti, we're all clashing in this house because we're all three extremely independent personalities and COVID for us was a real challenge. Um, and so we just, Sean and I were like, well, we're going to step up to the challenge here and become better parents. And we don't know how to do that. So we called her and <laughs> she's well, on speed I, dial. <laughs> I suppose I'll leave you with this thought, everyone, that, you know, parenting is a journey and it's a long haul. It doesn't, you know, you don't stop being a parent when your children are adults. It, you have to navigate your relationships through the whole process. And I, and I don't think we were ever meant to do the parenting journey on our own. Um, you know, the extended family is all but diminished and most of us don't have aunties or mums or whatever that we, that we are close to. So we do need to find like-minded people to, to, to walk alongside us um, on this journey. And we all hit crises as parents. Um, I'm doing what I do because of my own crises and my own parenting journey. And, you know, I, I want to help parents, you know, prevent those pitfalls. And there's nothing like children to grow you up, as mm. um, Leila was saying, you know, that, um, you know, that it is a call to action that you spend time on the important things, you know, relationships are all we have in the end, you know, and navigating them is we require more skill than most of us have <laughs> to navigate um, relationships healthily. So we need to draw on the expertise and um, experiences of others along the way and not see it as something that's wrong with us when we do need help from others. Mm. Um, I certainly am very grateful for the people that have, you know, I've reached out to in my parenting journey that have helped me through the challenges and, um, you know, I'm all the stronger for it. So I think that's the key for us as parents is to find those people. And I think even more so important too because, like you said, we're not connected with our family anymore. But, you know, we don't share necessarily share the same values as our family and, and, and parenting as well. And so that can cause a lot of friction and, you know, um, different so I think it is important to seek the people that you align with on that sort of thing. Um, well, I think it's just too hard to reach out to our family members as well, often, um, because of all the history. Mm. You know, there's probably a lot we can um, learn from everyone in our families as well. But, um, you know, it's too emotionally charged <laughs> sometimes. Mm. So the objectivity of an outsider means, you know, that that we that we can take um, the action steps easier. Mm. I think it's a big part of us. Uh, I think our evolution as human beings is learning to ask for help. And you know, how can you have a child that asks for help if you can't ask for help yourself? Yeah, and that's true independence, knowing when to do it alone and when to get others alongside you mm. that is true you know true independence is the ability to be interdependent yeah absolutely and that's how we have relationship that's how we connect with each other we weren't meant to do this alone no. so fern is running online workshops she has people doing them from all over the world <laughs> so you can contact fern now so fern's in a different state to me fern and i've actually never worked together in person she consults us over Skype or Zoom or whatever. So you can have her in your home doing parenting consultations. Um, I found it really helpful for us, you know, because we've come from different parenting backgrounds as well. So in those heightened moments where same all three page. of you are really, yeah, you're not on the same page and that's really important. So it's really good to have a third party to come in. She said, well, you know, Sean, you're doing this, but Leela, you're actually doing this. So how about we find a common path and agree as well on the terms, you know, children sense the division <laughs> like a dirty oh, rat. I <laughs> right? But it's a chance, like I think our relationship, from working with you, mine and Sean's relationship has gone to the next level because parenting is a team sport. It's not a, you know mums dads go to work and mums stay home and do the parenting and you know and that never worked anyway really <laughs> that never worked anyway <laughs> absent fathers and 
helicopter mothers. So, yeah. um, so yeah, so have a look at Fern's website. Please tell us about your upcoming workshops, Fern, and um, I will also put them all in the show notes so you guys can go straight there and book in for things and try for things and all that. Your website is theindependentchild.com. Yeah, thank and you what, for me. Thank you so much for coming, Fern. I hope everyone enjoys this. I hope this... I hope this also gets people out of listening to the other podcast going, oh, shit, I've totally up my child. (laughs) No, you haven't. No, you haven't. (laughs) More resilient than you think. (laughs) That's right. And I hope for those listening who don't have children yet, this gives you some insight into why you might do some things that you do but also motivates you to do some of this work before you have children. Hey, it would be a lot easier to do it before. (laughs) Oh, dear. All right. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for joining us. And yes, I hope everyone goes and checks out your courses coming up online. I'm Lena Lutz, and you've been listening to The Body Never Lies. If you haven't yet, please go to your favorite podcast app and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. All the resources and references from this episode are waiting for you on my website, Lena Lutz. Dot com. Just click on podcast and look for this episode. Now join me next week for another episode of The Body Never Lies. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>